thinking about the cross and thinking about the price that Jesus paid for us. You know, next Sunday is a Resurrection Sunday. We celebrate, we recognize the victory that was won when Jesus came out of the grave. But Jesus claimed victory when he was on the cross, when he said, it is finished. There were seven sayings from the cross. I want you to take out your Bible and look at Mark chapter 15, verse 12 through 47. That's a lot of verses. And we've got two beautiful things that Jesus set aside. He said, there are two things I want you to do for me when I'm gone. And he said it to his people, to his church. One of those is to remember me and the sacrifice that I paid by the recognition of the Lord's Supper. And we're going to do that in a few moments. The other thing was identify with me as you begin your ministry, recognizing when I died on the cross, I, I was buried in the ground and came back out of the grave. Jesus began his ministry with baptism, and there's a young man this morning who's going to be baptized also. All of these things, including the testimony, the baby dedication, all these things just came together on the same Sunday. And next Sunday, there are two or three individuals who've, who've asked about being baptized. In fact, two, two of those individuals did not even realize it was Easter. It's kind of like God is putting all the pieces together so that everyone who, who comes into these doors would recognize what Jesus has done for us. Um, we're going to have a lot more chairs set out next Sunday than what we have this Sunday, and we're going to need them. And so next Sunday, be sure and get here early enough and, and close in the gaps as much as you can in, in the seats so that uh, if folks come in late, it would be a blessing for them to be able to see seats, not that are in the center where they'd have to walk across people, but those on the edge. Edges. We really want to reach out to folks who maybe haven't been around Jesus in a long time, maybe since last Easter, next Sunday. Today we're looking at Christ's crucifixion. I was going to just read this scripture and then read the scripture about the uh, Lord's Supper and then read a scripture about baptism. Now I'm going to read those other two scriptures in a moment. But there's a few things uh, that I needed to point out that I haven't ever pointed out before as I've read through these scriptures. We've been studying through Mark, and so the majority of it I'm going to read, but I want to give you a few details that might just blow your mind. Mark 15 verse 12 says, now remember, Jesus was just before Pilate. The people said, we would rather have this murderer Barabbas. May Jesus die on Barabbas' cross with those others who were part of the insurrection or those who were standing up against Rome at that time. Pilate said in verse 12, and I, this is the part of the verses from last Sunday, What shall I do then with the one that you call king of the Jews? Pilate asked them. They said, Crucify him. Why? Pilate asked. What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the louder, crucify him, crucify him. And, and as it says all the louder, it's like it was in a repeated thing, like waves coming upon the ocean, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, one of Pilate's probably several downfalls, Pilate did release Barabbas to them. Remember, son of the father, Abba, is the name father as Jesus called him. And Bar Abbas means son of father. Then, then Pilate had Jesus flogged or beaten. It seems like it's not given the depth that it deserves, though across the different Gospels we learn other details about it. And then he handed him over to be crucified. Crucified, the, the word crucified, the word crucifixion, hanging on the cross, it's the place that we get, and if you think about the center of the word, it's excruciating pain. X C or how do you spell it? C R U C. The excruciating. The center of that is the crucifixion. It's where we get the excruciating pain, and it was gone. It was taken back to the cross and the sacrifices that Jesus did. Enough said about that. The soldiers led Jesus away to the palace. That is the Praetorium. This place where. They call together a whole company of soldiers. And then they put a purple robe on him. And then they twisted a crown of thorns and they set it upon his head. This crown of thorns and this purple robe. There's a little bit, if, if you're a person who is trying to find fault in the scripture, you could find a little bit of fault here. And that is if you look at other gospels. Because Matthew says that it was a scarlet robe. Or a crimson robe, depending on your translation. And yet, 
Mark and John say it was a purple robe. I looked up crimson and scarlet, and I looked up purple, and I found that those are two different colors. Well, was it a scarlet robe or was it a crimson robe? Which one was it that, that Jesus was wearing there? Here's something interesting, and I could go into a lot more detail, but I won't because of time. But purple in Mark uses a specific Greek word, and it's, it's a specific Greek word that was used for a specific purple. It was used for what is Tyrrhenian purple. There is, uh, the, the color purple was used uh, throughout the scripture in, in representing royalty. There was something unique, however, about Tyrrhenian purple. It was so valuable that if you had a robe made of Tyrrhenian purple, and purple was not an easy color for them to come across, they, they, there were actually, there had to be thousands of, of snails killed in order to get a pure purple color. A particular snail had to be killed, and, and as these snails gave up their life, called the Murex sea snails, then they would get this purple dye from it. But Tyrrhenian purple uh, was a mixture of things. And Rome uh, grabbed onto this color and they said this is going to be the color of royalty because the Tyrrhenian purple made in the Phoenician city of Tyre um, was included not only this murex sea snail that was a purple dye but also a reddish dye mixed with it obtained from a shellfish. So this Phoenician city took these two colors and they put them together and they made a unique color and the value of the garments that were made out of this color that was so very rare that only the very, very wealthy would, would even consider. In fact, there were some emperors not long after this, uh, over the next few hundred years after this, that said if anybody is seen wearing these colors other than the emperor, or other than Caesar, then they will be put to death. We claim this color. The value of the garments were worth their weight in silver. It was interesting that I read that they were worth their weight in silver. It's real possible that the, and this is just one of those speculative things, but it's real possible that the garment, the robe that was put on Jesus that represented royalty with the purple, represented the blood of Christ with the crimson that was blended, bleeding together if you would, that that robe was worth its weight in silver. I wonder if it would have been sold for about 30 pieces of silver based upon its weight. Just a thought. That was kind of an interesting thought in my mind. This Tyrrhenian purple, official royal color, but it was put on Jesus. It was put there to represent both royalty and the sin, the, the royalty and the, the, the blood of Jesus that we're going to share in just a few moments. In fact, if you look up Tyrrhenian purple, where this, this came from, you might find that, that Lydia in Acts, a follower of Jesus, was a seller of purple very valuable purple. It might have been the same stuff, but it, in, in, the, in the explanations of that and the colors that I found on, on the computer concerning that, Tyrrhenian purple, it says, actually looks more like maroon than purple. Look at your chair. What color is it? It's maroon. Did, would anybody say it's crimson? No. Would anybody say it's, it's purple? No. It's maroon. They may not have had a name for the color maroon, but they had a name for Tyrrhenian purple, which was the color that you're sitting on today. Not an accident, probably the Lord put those things together. Something else that wasn't an accident, and that they put this crown of thorns on his head. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, 17 and 18, uh, when the serpent was cursed, and Eve was cursed, and Adam was cursed. Adam was told, Adam, it's not going to be easy for you to eat anymore. You're going to have to plant, you're going to have to uh, grow fruit, grow vegetables by the sweat of your brow, and the land is not going to be nice to you. Because of the sin that's fallen on this earth, cursed is the ground because of you and your sin, Adam. The ground will produce thorns and thistles. It's interesting that Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, a song that we might sing in just a moment in preparation for the Lord's Supper, says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet or crimson, they shall be as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. And it's like Jesus taking on this, this maroon, this Tyrrhenian purple color, was taking on the sin of mankind 
And when he took that crown of thorns upon his head, he was taking on the curse of the world. All in the same wrappings of the crucifixion of Christ. Verse 18 through 22 says, And they began to call him King. Hail, King of the Jews. They were making fun of Jesus. Again and again, they struck him on the head. See, they'd given him not only that crown, they gave him that robe. They also gave him a staff. Here, King, you got to have a scepter. This will be your staff. And they gave it to him. And then they took that staff, that stick away from him. They started hitting him, beating him on the head where those crowns of thorns were. They hit him in the head with this stick that they had. Verse 19 says again and again, they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him. He had already been beaten. His, His flesh was opened up. His muscles had been torn his bones were showing in places and 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 his back probably uh, skin probably hung off of it like ribbons they would fall on their knees hail king of the jews and they paid homage to him and mocking him after they had mocked him they took off the purple robe and they put his own clothes on him took the purple robe off put his own clothes back on had to be soaked with blood by this time and by the way probably that purple robe was soaked with his blood also They led him out to crucify him then. A certain man from Cyrene, it's a a city in North Africa in Libya, uh, a certain man from Cyrene named Simon, interesting, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Alexander means, or Simon means rock, just like he did with Peter, Simon Peter. Alexander means defender of man and Rufus means red. Simon was passing by on his way in. He was coming in from the country. Now, it's possible that he was a Jewish man, part of a a Jews, about 100,000 Jews that probably lived there at Cyrene at the time because some of the Jews had separated themselves out in that northern African area. But he was coming there for some reason in this busy, busy, busy time of Passover with with a million uh, plus people in this uh, little town of, of, of... Jerusalem that normally had 80 to 100,000 people in it. This man Cyrene, uh, or Simon from Cyrene, it says they forced him to carry the cross. He didn't do it voluntarily. They forced him to carry the cross. Did you read in here that Jesus fell while carrying the cross? It's not found in the Bible. Maybe he did. Maybe he was so weak. And, and, and John talks about how he carried his cross. Maybe he did fall, but the Bible didn't say he fell. And there was no woman there named Virginia. And and the stations of the cross that we talk about uh, or that some some, uh, religions talk about are, are a beautiful story. But there's nothing scriptural and there's nothing provable about the stations of the cross. Sticking to the word, however, we find that this man was forced to carry the cross. Why? I'm not sure why. It's kind of interesting to me that Simon Peter denied the Lord. He could have been carrying Jesus' cross, a disciple of of Jesus's, but... God sent another Simon, and it was recorded that his name was Simon for a reason, and he carried the cross. I wonder if Simon Peter went, that should have been me, you know. When, when did God have to use somebody uh, outside of, of your circle or our circle of a church to do ministry that we should have been doing? And just thoughts. Verse 22 says they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, it says in verse 22 of Mark chapter 15. Matthew 27, 33 says they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, the skull. Luke 23, verse 33 says when they came to the place called the skull, in the King James Version it says when they came to the place called Calvary, See, in the King James Version, they took a Latin word. And guess what Calvary means? Skull. <laughs> Calvary means skull. When they came to the place of skull, the Latin word for, for skull is Calvary, they crucified him there. John nineteen seventeen says, carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There are some people who are so limited in their understanding, and I wouldn't say it as a put down because I've been very limited in my understanding also, who have thought that the place called the skull had to do with a mountainside that was a little bit open there and had three different holes in it, one for two eyes and and one for a nose. You got to be creative because I've looked at the side of that mountain and you got to pinpoint just a certain area there and go maybe this this bridge in the middle is looks like a nose maybe this is the skull and that was called the place of the skull 
that honestly is the weakest argument for giving this place the name, the mountain or the place of the skull just outside of the gates of Jerusalem. You could see it from that praetorium, from that area where Jesus was brought and mocked before those, those individuals where Pilate stood and, and condemned him to die. This place called the skull did not have to do with what that mountain has developed over the last 2,000 years to look like. Because land has changed in many ways over the 2,000 years. For heaven's sakes, the temple is underground over there. There's one wall that still can be seen that's been excavated. But the things that were on top of the ground, uh, like, like the houses and those kind of things, they're underground. Why would we think this mountain still looks like a skull that it did back then? It didn't have to do with that. It had to do with something that took place in 1 Samuel when little David grown man probably, but maybe a young man, stood before a giant of a man named Goliath. And Goliath, as, as hell and earth came into the greatest fight and conclave that had ever taken place, David depended on the grace of God, carrying five smooth stones. Maybe it had to do with Goliath's brothers. Definitely had to do with grace, because five means grace in the scripture, and I can prove it to you. But it, David took out that smooth stone and he put one in his sling and he threw it and it sunk into the head of old Goliath and Goliath didn't fall backwards, he fell forward like he was bowing down before the God that David worshipped. David went over and he took Goliath's own sword and he took it out of the scabbard or out of the hand of Goliath and he cut off Goliath's big old melon head. And he took that big old melon head from a guy that's between 9 and 12 feet tall, a giant, and he took that head, the scripture says, out to a place called Jerusalem. First hmm. Samuel chapter 17 verse 4 says there was a champion named Goliath. He was from Gath. Goliath from Gath. Sounds a whole lot like what became known as the place of the skull. Goliath's head was taken by David, I'm convinced, to the place just outside of what later was going to be walls around Jerusalem, to the place where Jesus was going to be crucified. And the scripture that was laid out in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 that says, Jesus to the serpent, God said, he will crush your head. You'll strike his heel to the serpent, but Christ figuratively crushed the head of Satan whenever he gave his life on Golgotha, the place of what? The skull. It didn't have to do with the mountain, it had to do with the head of Goliath that either was buried or sat on a pig poke outside of that place. That blows my mind, but, but it shouldn't blow our mind because the scripture talks about how the head of Jesus was going to be separated when he was in that very tomb. And the head of Goliath being separated from him had to do with the headship of Satan being separated from his body also for a period of time that's yet to come. The scripture is very clear about these things, and yet we get foggy-minded about this. The skull didn't say, any time they named a mountain, they would give it the clarity that it was the mountain so-and-so, it was Mount so-and-so, it was Mount something, it was Mount... They didn't say that. This was the place of the skull. Do you understand that? There's more depth to that, and I can share more with you over time. Why is it significant that David did that? And, and what does it tell us in the prophecies and in the future about what Jesus did? There's a passage in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 and 7 says, A Savior is going to be born. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Upon the throne of David he will reign. And upon his kingdom, his reign, to order it and to establish it with justice and with judgment. The reason Jesus is going to come back and establish his throne upon the throne of David is because that's where the victory was won. To the greatest foe that Satan could attack mankind with. And Satan was embodying this giant called Goliath. Golgotha. Where did the name Golgotha come from? I don't know, but they named it Golgotha after Goliath's head was put there. In fact, Goliath from Gath, which sounds a whole lot like Golgotha, let's call it a skull place. It blows my mind, doesn't it? Verse 23. Then they offered Jesus 
wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. Remember, myrrh was one of those. He was given gold, frankincense, and myrrh as a baby. Gold to symbolize his, king, she, his kingship, his kingly nature. Frankincense to recognize him as priest. The incense, frank incense that was put in the temple. And the myrrh had to do with his death. Myrrh was an analgesic that had to do with something that if you took it, it, it killed pain. It helped with the mind. It, myrrh is used today for many, many, many different uh, healing properties. Look it up. He was given myrrh. In fact, he was offered it, but he didn't take it. They crucified him, verse 24 says, dividing his clothes up. They cast lots to see who would get each one. It was prophecy. I won't go into details there. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him, verse 25 says. And the written notice, the charge against him, because they had put the charges up on a placard above the, the cross where they were crucified. The charge against Jesus read, King of the Jews, this is your charge. They crucified two rebels with him, one on his right side and one on his left side. Verse 28 is not found in the NIV because it's not in the latest manuscripts there. But King James uses uh, Luke 22 verse 37 for verse 28 here. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled with those who were there saying he was murdered or he was numbered with the transgressors. Verse 29 says, those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, so... You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, why don't you come down and save yourself? Verse 31. In the same way, the chief priests and the teachers of the law mocked Jesus, the Lord. Among themselves, they said, well, he saved others. Can't he save himself? And one of the sayings came from the cross that's not listed in your and not listed in Mark, but it's listed in Luke 23, where Jesus listened to and took in all of these things that were being said to him and about him and all these things. And he said in Luke 23, 34, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They're like dumb little children. They just don't understand. They're not dumb. They were ignorant of the truth at this time. There's a difference. Verse 32 says, let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, those, those teachers of the law and Pharisees said. If he comes down from the cross, we'll see, we'll believe. And those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. At least one of them did. There's one that says in Luke 23, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus. One of those thieves that was hanging next to Jesus on the cross. And Jesus said, uh, second saying of the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Today, this day, you'll be with me in paradise. Paul used that same word for heaven on a few occasions in the end of Corinthians. And then Jesus looked down at his, his mother over here, Mary, and the other ladies who had been there and, and other gentlemen. In fact, one of the disciples certainly was there. The others were probably standing behind trees. One of them was close to Mary. It was John, the beloved, the one who wrote the book of John. Not John the Baptist. He was already dead. And Jesus said that third saying of the cross. He said, woman, behold thy son. And then he said, behold thy mother. He used that term woman again. That was the term he used when he first did his first miracle. When he turned the water into wine, which was symbolic of, of those ceremonial jars of cleansing. Had to do with mankind because it used the number six and man's number is six. Revelation tells us. That's why Satan takes the number of man and the number of God, 666. But the fact is that those six stone water jars were used with water for ceremonial cleansing under the Old Covenant. And Jesus turned the water into wine, symbolic of his blood that we're going to take in just a little while. And, and when, G, when Mary said, Jesus, they have no more wine, Jesus used the term, he said, woman. I used that with my mom once. No, I didn't. Jesus used it. But it wasn't a, something that showed disgrace to his mother. It was something that separated him from his earthly family to his heavenly responsibility. Verse 33 says, At noon darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out, Three in the afternoon, it was dark. From noon, when the sun should be shining, there was a phenomenon that took place that cannot be explained because in the time frame there, there was no eclipses that took place. It was not until three years later that an eclipse took place. But it wouldn't have fit with this because this darkness was different. It was something that God did that had never been done before and hadn't been done since. 
when it went dark at 3 in the afternoon after from 12 to 3, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, verse 34 says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. El means God. That oi means my. My God. My God, as it says. Why have you forsaken me? You too, God. God had to because God couldn't face the sin that Jesus was about to take on. God couldn't receive the sin. Oh, that means we can't have the play day. I can preach for a long time. <laughs> no, we're still going to eat. Verse 35, when some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah, because they heard that L, and Elijah had to do with God's prophet, Elijah. When Elijah, he was calling in, in John 19, verse 28, the next saying of the cross, when Jesus said, I thirst. Verse 36, someone ran and filled a sponge with wine vinegar. They put it on a staff, on a stick, and they offered it to Jesus to drink. John 19 says it was a hyssop branch that was used. They put that sponge on there, said, here, you want to drink something? They lifted up a hyssop branch, and they lifted it up to Jesus. The picture of the crucifixion of Christ was first laid out in Exodus chapter 12, and it was laid out in Exodus chapter 12 by them taking a hyssop branch... Killing a lamb, which Jesus was the Lamb of God, putting his blood in a bowl and sitting at the bottom of their doorpost, take that hyssop branch, dip it in that blood and put some of the blood on this side, some of the blood on the top, and some of the blood on this side of the doorpost. And there's a picture of the crown of thorns at the top, his hands at the side, and his feet at the bottom, and a hyssop branch was lifted up. David said, purge me with hyssop, Lord, and I'll be whiter than snow. I think it's in Psalm 51. He was crying out for the blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of God to purge him because that hyssop pointed us to the cross. After they lifted up that for Jesus to drink, he didn't, of course. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, they'd say. With a loud cry, with a loud cry, and I won't do it loud just in case your husband is asleep. Jesus breathed his last words. He said the last two sayings of the seven sayings recorded on the cross. Jesus said in John 19.30, and it must have bounced off the mountains that were on those areas over there. It is finished! All of the power that he could muster claimed that the price was paid. It was done. Sin was paid. I wonder if his heart had already burst at that time because later we know that when the, the spear was poked in his side, out, what outflowed was a mixture of, of water and blood. He said the last saying on the cross, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit in Luke twenty three forty six. Verse 38, the curtain of the temple was torn from the top to the bottom and the Holy Spirit that dwelt in that holy place left that holy place never to return not during your lifetime or my lifetime, to the temple again. In fact, never. I don't know if, it's, I don't know if the Holy Spirit is going to indwell that place during the seven-year tribulation or not, but I know that now your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us that in around verse 16. The temple was no longer there as a dwelling of God. God is dwelling in you through the Holy Spirit. When the centurion, the centurion, a specific Roman officer who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how Jesus died, listen, come in close to this. This centurion looked up, this Roman officer, and he said, surely this man was the son of God. He knew. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed Jesus and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It was preparation day. That is the day before the Sabbath. It was a according to John 19.31. It was a Sabbath. And it was a special Sabbath that was taking place at this time. Verse... 43 says, as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Jewish council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body. Note, Joseph was a protected provider when God chose Joseph to be the, the daddy of Jesus. 
that Joseph was gone, so another Joseph stepped up. It's kind of like the Simons that we talked about a while ago. This Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Jewish ruling council that began this journey of Jesus' death, himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly before Pilate, asked for Jesus' body, verse 44 through 47, says Pilate was surprised to hear that, that Jesus was already dead. They didn't die that fast. It usually took about three days for him to die. But summoning the centurion, the centurion, this specific Roman officer, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When the, he learned from the centurion that it was so that Jesus was dead, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth. Some linen cloth means not a linen cloth, like the Shroud of Turin. That is not scriptural. These linen cloths were strips of linen cloth, according to John 19, verse 39 through 40. They wrapped Jesus in strips of linen cloth, just like those strips that probably were there that he was wrapped in when he was a baby in swaddling clothes, tightening him up so that he could, he could be comfortable. So Joseph brought some linen cloth, took the body down, wrapped it in that, those linen cloths, placed it in a tomb, cut out of a rock. And the last verse says, Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph was there and saw where they laid him. I want us to sing a song. Take out your song sheets. I want us to sing through this song, There is a Fountain. And men, as we get close to the end of this song, the 16 men who were supposed to help us with the Lord's Supper, if you'd, if you'd come up when we go to that last verse, I'd appreciate it. This is your heart preparation for partaking of the Lord's table. Not my table, not our church's table, the Lord's table. Let's pray. Father, we approach your table now. We're going to eat our meal just like you 
encouraged us to do in a little while separate from these things. This is the table in which we recognize your body. We recognize your blood. We recognize your life. And we're grateful that you call us your children. And we couldn't be called that if our sins were not forgiven. Father, if there's anybody in this room who has not accepted you yet as, as their Savior, in the midst of this prayer, before they take these elements, may they say, Jesus, I heard today and I recognize that you died for me. May they realize they can't get into heaven with their sins because the garbage of sins don't go into where God is. It's an impossibility for his purity and sins to be together. It has to be through the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, no one will come to the Father except by me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, if someone has not accepted you, may they be even doing that now. As the songs play and the elements of your body are passed out, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. white as snow
Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. There's possibly nothing more beautiful to Jesus than what we're doing today. And your heart and your spirit even now. If you can take those up, those men, if you can take those up. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23, Paul said, what I uh, received from the Lord, I pass on to you. And it had to do with this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread when he had given thanks. He broke the bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Did y'all get one? He prayed first. Father, we thank you for sending your son. Jesus, we thank you for voluntarily coming and laying down your life who, in front of men who had no power over you, but you voluntarily laid down your life. Singing of, my Singing of our Redeemer. Redeemer. With our hearts lifted up to you, we recognize in remembrance of you what you've done. Thank you for this season of our remembrance. We look forward to our resurrection also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Took an aid. Sing, oh, sing of my Redeemer with his blood. He purchased me. He purchased me.
again in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It says in the same way after supper he took the cup and as he took that cup he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The wine represents my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Philip Howard, come on up here. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the beautiful people. This seems like possibly the sweetest time, possibly because of us looking at some of the details of your death and your burial. We look forward to next Sunday when we celebrate your resurrection. Oh, we've looked forward to that for a while because it's, it's been tough walking through the tough times with you, Lord. But I know that if it were not for those tough times where you laid down your life, we would have no joy, we'd have no future. We couldn't have a, a comforter who walked with us today and we'd have no hope for heaven because we couldn't get into heaven with our sins. Thank you for guiding us. And Lord, wherever you do lead, may we be your servants as we walk in your will throughout the rest of our life for Philip's life, the Philip Howard that's about to be baptized, Lord, I thank you that he's willing, like you, to lay down his life before men, confessing you before men, that you would confess him before the Father in heaven. For these things, we give you the praise in Christ's name. Amen. In Romans chapter 6, the scripture tells us very clearly that we identify with Jesus' death, with his burial and his resurrection in the waters that are laid down here. Philip came to me just a, uh, well, he, he actually contacted me a couple of weeks ago and said that he has accepted Christ. Philip, have you accepted Christ as your Savior? I know that you have. I'm grateful for your work. I'm glad the Lord brought you back here from West Texas so you could be a part of this walk and of this ministry also. Step on in there. You want to take your glasses? You want to baptize them too? It's okay. I remember one time the old fellow that stepped into the waters to be baptized and the preacher said, I think you still have your billfold there. And he said, well, you might as well baptize all of me. And he went down, money and all. How about that? Philip, as the scripture is laid out for us, Jesus laid down his life, but he came out of that grave. And the picture of you laying down your life here 
coming out of this place for the sake of living a life for Jesus. When he said he wanted us to lay down his life, he didn't say we have to die for our sins. We have to accept him who died for our sins and he wants us to live for him. It's because of your profession of faith, step up one more step in Jesus Christ that it's our privilege today to get to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. There you go, brother. Let's pray one last time and thank God for this food we're about to eat in this very room. And if it's not too wet and some kids want to ride a sheep, that still can be done. Or we can put that off to another Sunday. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful, beautiful people. For the glory of this day. For the rain, the showers of blessings, we give you the glory. May, may more and more showers come. If they happen on Sundays, we'll thank you for that. There will be plenty of time for us to enjoy your creation here. But we thank you for this food and for the two pigs that laid down their life on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.